Okay, welcome everybody. Uh, I'm Marty Andres, and I'm going to be hosting today's webinar, uh, our Don't Waste the COVID-19 Crisis webinar that's co-sponsored by uh, <clears throat> the Center for Behavior Institutions and the Environment, the Resilience Alliance, and Arizona State University, and ISC, uh, where we're coming together every other week to uh, think about how we can learn from uh, COVID-19 and improve the way we interact with each other in the environment. So today's discussion is on one of the issues that's near and dear to me. It's, I think, one of the issues that started the sustainability movement around fishery, over-exploitation of uh, ocean resources. So today we have four panelists who are going to be talking about fishing for ways to survive in a COVID-19 ocean. Uh, our panelists uh, are Javier Basurto, who's an associate professor of sustainability science at Duke University. Uh, he'll be chairing the, the um, discussion after I hand off to him. We have three distinguished panelists, Bonnie McKay from Rutgers University, who's in the Department of Human Ecology in the School of Environmental and Biological Sciences, Moniba Isaacs, who <clears throat> is at the Laboratory for Land and Agrarian Studies, uh, Vivian Solis from the International Collective in support of fish workers and, wow, Copa de Solidar in Costa Rica. I hope I said that right. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and turn over to Javier and uh, let him lead the show. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Marty. Uh, I'm sharing my screen with everybody. Um, thank you for that introduction. Um, so the way we are going to um, have this discussion, this conversation, is we uh, organize it around uh, several questions. Uh, and we're gonna focus our discussion on the first two questions that you can see on your screen. What challenges and opportunities does COVID-19 raise for the fishers' ability to engage in successful collective action to sustain their livelihoods? And to put it in a broader context, uh, how might the recent protests in the US and other parts of the world be related to the effects of COVID-19 and how it might affect fisheries. And then, uh, so we're gonna go around the table and we're gonna, um, each of us is gonna present uh, on, on those two questions for the most part. And the two last questions we're gonna touch, um, particularly the last question we're gonna touch at the end to what are some of the implications and research questions that uh, this near reality of COVID-19 ocean uh, opens to scholars of the commons. And we, we chose um, to talk about a COVID-19 ocean um, because uh, we're thinking this not necessarily is gonna pass. This is gonna be a new, a new normal. So we can think of a COVID-19 ocean um, that way. So uh, without further ado, um, let me pass uh, to my colleague Vivian Solis, who's gonna share her screen next. Well, um, it's a pleasure to be here. First of all, I would like to thank IASC for inviting us to this interview. Um, I am here representing two organizations that deal with issues related to human rights and sustainable fisheries and um, also marine conservation. And we deal with issues related to self-reliant sustainable fisheries in the field and we support small scale fishers in their collective action. The International Collective in Support of Fish Workers is a global organization and Cope Solidar, which is located in Costa Rica uh, and where I'm speaking you from. Um, it's very interesting to see that the COVID-19 ocean for small scale fishers has brought in our territorial area uh, several considerations. First, no access to the beach and fishing grounds. This is one that it's affecting strongly the communities that depend on food security. The second one is no differentiated attention to fisherwomen needs. And of course, I think this is common worldwide, no tourism, no markets, no fur prices, no attention to the situation of no formality. And this is particularly interesting in countries like Costa Rica, where maybe 80% of our small scale fishers are non-formal. That means that usually they cannot access some of the support 
uh, that, that we have. Um, and this is bringing more poverty and more marginalization in our communities. So one of the issues that we have seen this past months is that even with all this situation, all, all this situation is um, really not causing us not to be able to work. We are working with the fishers and some of them are in good spirit and hoping for the best uh, in their hard situation. And th this is because vulnerability and marginalization has always occurred in the SSA world. This is not a new situation, it's just one that has made evident the truth. And we have seen that those communities that have been able to have several factors have been more resilient to the actual situation caused by the COVID-19. For example, those communities where small scale fishing has a very strong cultural identity and is a way of life, have been able to have at least some link to food security and be able to fight for the right to go fishing, even when some of their activities have been prohibited by the police in some areas. Also those who are organized and who are um, able to discuss the problems in their community have been able to support others in this situation and they have used the traditional knowledge to make uh, possibilities to the most vulnerable people in their communities. And of course, those communities that have some efforts or initiatives towards responsible fishing have provided also some possibilities for these communities to lead. Marine territories of life are vital. And this picture uh, that I'm showing to you is in Barra de Colorado, the Caribbean coast of Costa Rica, where processing shrimp women are working. Um, and the space is not only for economic benefit, but it's also a, a social uh, space where women can share between them the problems and the issues that are a priority in their community. So we have a lot of challenges to work, and I think we have been working in these challenges for a long time now. A human rights-based approach to marine conservation is very a very important issue in Central America because we have a lot of environmental uh, organizations that sometimes are moving communities out of these areas that are their territories of life. Recognition of shared governance, how power is shared between local communities of fishers and indigenous people in those marine territories of life. The issue of decent work and dignity that goes together with the non-formality consideration, tenure and access rights, gender considerations, and a fair and just distribution of benefits, the rights from the use of um, the sea resources. And I wanna make an emphasis here that this last one is very important, but it's not the only issue that it's a challenge for uh, looking at small scale fisheries in the situation of COVID-19. I would like to, for you to see this picture that show us the big diversity of small scale fishing um, situations that we have. These are mollusk gatherer women from the Pacific and South uh, coastal areas in Costa Rica. And these women uh, are also part of a small scale fishing. So this diversity has to do with a lot of different economic and social strategies that will have to be brought now as um, we advance towards um, the future. For example, these ladies have now uh, been linked to direct markets, to direct buyers. So the problem of the market, which was making them very, very vulnerable, has been able to improve a little while we advance. At the local level, we have different situations. What we see here is the Honduras Garifuna population of small scale fishers that had a, a, a process of self fish, self uh, jellyfish selling to the international markets. This has caused them a very serious problem now that the market has been closed because basically this small scale fishing community doesn't have work anymore because the market has been totally closed off. So when um, we are talking about small scale fisheries, we need to have in mind the different situations in which each one of these um, is, uh, is located or is caused by, by the, the situation. Now, 
um, what we have seen is that in front of the COVID-19 ocean situation, we need a radical change, an abrupt change in how these global commons are deal with. And we have a tool, a very important tool, which are the voluntary guidelines for the sustainability of the small scale fishers in the context of food security and poverty eradication that has the main key issues that need to be changed. Those are structural aspects related to the need to see a human rights-based approach in front of the situation of small-scale fisheries has and can be uh, strongly changed if we implement this document that has been developed with the participation of fisher organizations throughout the world. And in this sense, I believe that we need an FAO, which is the institution that is backing up this, stronger in asking the governments to move on into a human rights-based approach to small-scale fisheries. We have a post-COVID ocean dream, and I need to say that it's not very different to what we had before COVID. Because as I said, this marginalization and this structural problems of SSF have been there for a long time now in our countries. But we do imagine a future. And we imagine a future hoping that this situation will bring out attention to this very forgotten sector. We um, dream on secure collective territories of small scale fishing communities. We really dream about full participation of this sector in decision-making, which has not occurred up to now. We hope to enhance this resilience that I have been uh, talking to you before, and improvement in the condition that these communities have, especially collective action and organization, as a key issue that needs to be dealt with to improve the conditions. We really need to dialogue and co-process for generation of knowledge. And this knowledge has to do with science and has to do with traditional knowledge. And we need to recognize that sustainable use is a must in these communities. So changing uh, fisheries ideas to other things, other productive acti activities has not been successful for these territories of life. And we need to diversify, but in a way that cultural identity is very linked to the livelihoods of these communities. We also dream about a first and just markets for all and a rights-based approach to marine conservation. If we are able to move together as a planet towards the implementation of the SSF guidelines that basically bring in a holistic approach to small scale fisheries, we would be really going into this COVID ocean with the most hope, hoping and um, special and positive uh, situation that might bring this sector into the development and well-being of a lot of communities throughout the world. Thank you, Vivian. Thank you. Thank you much. So now I'm gonna um, move to the second question, uh, our my colleague Moniva Isaacs um, is gonna from she's from South Africa, so she is gonna comment and tell us uh, a little bit her perspective, her take in the second question that is there, how some of the recent protests um, around the world related to inequality, poverty, um, are related to some of the effects we see of COVID nineteen. Um, please, Moniva, take it away. Thank you very much. Good evening, everybody. It is just after 2100 hours in Cape Town. It is a chilly evening in Cape Town, um, as you can imagine. So um, for me to tackle the question in terms of what are the current protests in the US relate and how does that relate to the situation in South Africa? So I want to say first that Cape Town is currently the epicenter of the coronavirus in South Africa, but also the epicenter of the coronavirus in Africa, so on the continent. Cape Town is also one of the most unequal uh, cities in the world. 
Uh, it's also um, the center of industrial fisheries in, in um, Cape Town and the industrial fisheries in Cape Town started in 1896. It, it is uh, by no uh, coincidence that through the Dutch East Indian Company, um, slaves, there's a lot in currently in the US about the slaves from Africa 400 years ago but there are also slaves from the East through the Dutch East Indian Company to Cape Town that, um, that, that, that is um, important. So we have a slave trade, we have industrial fisheries, and also in terms of when we're talking about a microcosm of world fisheries, we have a, a rich industrial fisheries, commercial fisheries, small scale fisheries, and also subsistence fisheries situated in the background of the US, we also had a, a apartheid system that is based on race-based capitalism. So the inequality and poverty is, 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 a, is a key part and the marginalization and vulnerabilities of a sector and of a people of small-scale fisheries is part of, of that particular picture. I want to say that conservation in South Africa is also often viewed as um, fortress conservation. We need to exclude, uh, we need to preserve uh, the ocean, we don't need to conserve the ocean. And in most cases, um, poor communities are, are out, left outside of conservation. Um, the pandemic in South Africa is not merely a public health issue. It is combined with a set of economic, social, and political challenges that uh, basically increase uh, the vulnerability and limit the access in terms of tenure, land, and natural resources. So the commons is a key part in terms of how the pandemic and the, the inequality is thread into, into that. A common thread in the COVID hard lockdown in South Africa is the issue of malnutrition and hunger. The stark choices people have to make in terms of, do I go hungry uh, uh, or do I face risking uh, the virus? And um, this is situated in um, poverty, inequality, unemployment and malnutrition but also the invisibility of people and a sector of small-scale fisheries in the bigger picture of South Africa. I have a statement of a, of a fisherman um, and what is his perspective of COVID-19? Charles America, related, no, no relation to the United States, um, is a veteran fisher and also an activist. And he basically said that the COVID-19 uh, pandemic actually just further illustrate how insignificant and how severely neglected we as a legitimate group uh, um, resource use group uh, uh, um, is. And, and Charles situ situates his discontentment in the failed policies in South Africa, lack of implementation, the privatization of fishing rights, the individual transferable quotas, a system that commodifies the fishing right. The ITQ system primarily concerned in promoting economic e efficiency rather than conservation, community welfare, or equity. So in practice, it seeks um, with the post-apartheid, it seeks where, where it broadened resource access in terms of transformation while economics just concentrate access. And this is what um, Charles or America also say. We are currently in a lockdown in terms of COVID-19 regulations, but he feels that he has been in a permanent lockdown since 1994 in terms of the vulnerability, but in terms of his vulnerability, in terms of his marginalization as a group of, of fisher. So, so in terms of, of, of how it impacts uh, people's lives, West Coast rock lobster is a highly that a price. Uh, fishery. And, and this particular fishery, 90% uh, of 
it is marketed towards China. And in December already, they felt the impact of the COVID-19 uh, uh, regulations because China did not accept uh, West Coast rock lobster. So a direct impact on the livelihood, um, economic impact and the vulnerability of of, uh, of um, uh, small-scale fisheries. It is also important to note that the small-scale fisheries in South Africa is also integrated in this economic system where the, the, the little crumbs that the fishers get of the West Coast rock lobster is, it, it, it helps in terms of sustainable livelihoods, but the, the intermediaries the middlemen, the, the industrial is, uh, fisheries and the market system, it's, it's, it's very unfair and very unequal and further marginalize and further exploit um, this group of, of fishers. I think it's also important to mention relation in terms of Costa Rica and Vivian's presentation is the issue of, of gender. And um, a, a fisherwoman from Oniston in the south uh, western uh, coast of South Africa basically sees this particular lockdown as a double burden. First of all, all the restrictions that Vivian mentioned in terms of, of, of um, no, uh, the, the limits to movement is, is, is cross-cutting. All governments have seemed to have followed the same protocol. And, and, and for her, it's the pre-harvesting and the post-harvesting and whatever crafts and whatever um, activities or food that have made has been stopped because uh, there's no economic activity that, that, that they are able to engage in. Added to that, they're also responsible now to uh, homeschool their children. So it's a matter of in, including um, uh, uh, women uh, in terms of the pre-harvest and the post-harvest, but also in terms of, of home, homeschooling, that particular extra burden that, that women have in, 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 um, in terms of, of, of this particular sector. So a current immediate drop in income and immediately the need for food parcels. Um, immediate need for food security, immediately a need for for income, and and we have called it in South Africa a COVID grant, which is similar to the basic income grant. And hopefully in South Africa, the start of this COVID grant that have been given to unemployed is, is about 350 Rand, and you can divide that by 17.5 uh, US dollars is the current rate. That is what is the government has been allocating to unemployed for one particular month, not even one dollar a day if if we want to equate to 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 those particular statistics. But yet the immediate and present need is around food, is around hunger, is around malnutrition. And the protest in South Africa around food and around food parcels is is also in relation to to what currently is happening in 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 terms of uh, of the US, so Javier, I'm going to stop there and and maybe uh, give Bonia a chance to give her insight, and maybe we can have a discussion further on on these um, these issues. Thank you. Thank you, Moniva. Yeah, I think it's very. Um clear how some issues that go beyond the, the aspect of just harvesting are interweaved into the broader um, issue of fishing, right? So, so thank you for that. Um, Bonnie, do um, you want to take it from here? Yes, thank you very much. I'm, uh, I have a general comment of, before I talk about the specific cases that I've been looking at. And this has to do with the fundamental, well, the, the issue of, of, um, of COVID-19, of the coronavirus or the post-coronavirus, the future, 
is one of unpredictability. We don't know what's going to happen. We really do, do not know. And I think most smart people will acknowledge that. That's the one key feature. But isn't this the story of fishing? I mean, isn't this, this is unpredictability is just a kind of a, a fact of life for people who live uh, with some dependence on, on the resources of the sea. And so there is, as, as Vivian pointed out in her great presentation, you know, a lot of resilience that's partly based upon the experience people have had with unpredictability and their ability to respond to change, you know, unforeseen changes and losses and opportunities. So I, I think this is something that we, we will, is a, is a sort of a general um, comment about the effects of COVID-19. Um, and I would agree also that this pandemic has really fundamentally um, built upon and intensified existing trends and existing structural issues. And, and um, you know, Moniba has certainly underscored the latter in a, in a very important way. I, I do research in the, uh, the, on the, in the Canadian and the US Atlantic areas. And this is with fisheries that are of Canada and the United States, two very, very wealthy industrialized countries. So the context is quite different in that the people who fish have access to all kinds of other resources. In Newfoundland, where I'm currently doing, uh, currently living in, in hideout from coronavirus as best I can away from the United States, which is totally chaotic right now, but that's a side point. Um, I'm, it, the, the pandemic is certainly making a big, big difference though to the the, uh, the the coastal regions, which are heavily dependent on fishing. However, has the, the evolution of this has been one, well, first of all, the, the longer term is one of, of always commercial fishing that is highly dependent on export markets. It was settled hundreds of years ago to serve export markets and it continues to have that orientation. Things have changed a great deal and the survival of these, these remote coastal fishing communities has depended heavily on their becoming more diversified, however. There was the great well-known collapse of the cod fishery in the early 1990s. And the end of that, the end of, end of many of the small scale fisheries was, um, was, was predicated on the, on the collapse of that fishery, the cod fishery. So the fisheries have evolved to be much more involved with uh, crustaceans like shrimp and crab, and also uh, sea cucumbers. And, uh, but again, oriented toward European and Chinese, Japanese, other export markets. And they, so they've diversified in that way. But the main thing that's happened and is that fishing itself has become more and more marginal within these communities less and less important because tourism has evolved to be much more important and uh, economically in many of these places including the one that i live in here and secondly people have found alternatives in the oil and gas industry uh, both newfoundland's offshore in uh, oil and gas but also moving to um, at, migrating to the oil sands of alberta the mines of the Yukon and so forth. So we've had both, we've had tourism and, and, the develop, and access to um, the hydrocarbon part of the world, the indust totally industrialized part of the world for people who fish. As, and then they've also been at parts of well, fairly wealthy governments. And in the case of Canada, um, one that provides a lot of social services to the fishers, including a very generous unemployment policy. So right now in the, in the pandemic situation is not one of, of malnutrition. There's a lot of distress and concern about paying mortgages and paying off um, automobile loans and so forth. But uh, the governments have been very generous. However, fishing is, they, they is seen as separate. It, fishing is, is, is classified as essential. So the people who fish must fish and they do not have the choice of not working right now. And they have to worry about how to fish in a safe way, in a way that will reduce their exposure to
to people who might be carrying the virus. And then the people who work in the processing plants also must work because they are classified as essential workers. And they too have to worry about uh, being protected from the possibility that somebody is going to come in carrying the virus. So th they are in the midst, they're in the midst of this whole world of, of worrying about social distancing and, and protective equipment. And the, the governments are doing their best to help them out. Um, this is some of the context. Now, so that so the, the people are able to fish and they are doing, they're finding ways to do that. However, as elsewhere, the demand for their seafood has plummeted. There is virtually the closure of some markets and, and the just the decline of demand in other markets. And here I've seen some innovation occurring. Um, the with the with this plummeting international demand for their seafood, they've scrambled to find and create local markets. And so um, they people who fishing for lobster, for example, are taking their lobster to the smaller towns around and finding out that there are lots and lots of people quite willing to to purchase it at a lower price than they would get, of course, get it in the international markets. And in part, one thing that's happening is that the, the, the kind of creation of or the strengthening of local systems of, of food exchange of community. Um, and, and that is one of the things, what kind of a positive feature of, of this pandemic. Um, people are working much more closely together and exchanging the, and buying and selling the, the fish amongst themselves. And I, I know that seems kind of a, a small, small thing, but it's, it's important. I've also thought about this in terms of the commons and the issue of access. And one thing that happened with the, in the wake of the, the collapse of the cod fishery was a greater privatization of access to, the, to fishing for crab and shrimp and the other, um, the other systems. And so eventually we worked toward what is similar to an ITQ system. So the people who do fish at a, are, are, I have to buy into that system and there are fewer and fewer people who can afford to do that. And there's actually a crisis going on of the lack of young people to carry on the fishery because they cannot afford what, is, what it costs to be able to purchase the rights that they need to be able to fish economically. So this, is, this is a, has been happening for some time. It's a process that's happening. And I'm thinking that now that where everything else has collapsed, certainly the oil and gas business has collapsed and, the, um, and, and, with, and then the, the um, the markets for their seafood have collapsed because of restrictions due to the pandemic. Fishing is even more important than ever. And this issue of access is, a, is, is being raised and people are beginning to ask, well, why is it so expensive for young people? Surely there are other ways for them to get involved in this. What happened to the truly small scale fisheries that we used to have that were available to younger people? And there are some people now who are beginning to purchase smaller boats that they can afford and trying to move back into the fisheries in a way that they were excluded from before. So there's some, some interesting changes that are occurring that are worth monitoring and supporting where, where possible. The context also includes, however, it, for this area, a long history of collective action on the part of the local cooperatives that have um, from time to time exercised a great deal of power in improving the conditions of fishing and also the pr prices that they get and in ensuring where possible that result the distribution of benefits in supports the local communities and also a, a larger regional union that is very very active and that's made a big difference to uh, the ability of the fisheries to to survive in this um, so so it's a, it's a somewhat different context but these these issues are perhaps in a slightly different form, it's very similar to what's found elsewhere. Um, and so, it, you know, as I said before, the, the, the pandemic builds upon and in, intensifies trends and structural issues that I haven't gotten into, of power and so forth between the harvesters and the buyers and different different gear types and so on and so forth. But what about the protests? And the whole protest thing, I think, just raises, and I'll start, end with this, this is the bigger, it, you know, it's the bigger picture of the possible 
in some areas in the United States fairly clearly potential for the destruction of civil civil society as and it, certainly the weakening of civil society and um, or or at least the challenge of of allowing that civil society which as we know the commons depends so much on to become weakened versus efforts to really reclaim fairness and equity and equity before the law um, and so forth so we're in a we're in a situation like that where um, we really have to worry about 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 this and I um, I don't you know I, it's something that that we see much more in the United States than than Canada but it still lurks here as well so thank you very much for your time and I'll hand it over to Xavier thank you Bonnie I, I think yeah you are you're pointing to a a very interesting dilemma that I haven't thought too much, but um, in, in your last comment about the weakening of civil society. And in and, and this intervention, I'll take um, 10 minutes to reflect on what we have said and, and share a little bit on, on the reality of Mexico. Um, and in my reflection is, is trying to distill what are some of the important questions we've been considering. So, so I grab to the, the last point you, you talked about for, about weakening of civil society. And I think you're pointing to an interesting dilemma because what I see or what I hear from Mexico is that a lot of fishers are um, strengthening their collective action in their communities. As international markets are collapsing, and that's a quote, that's their own words, uh, there are restoring to either local or regional markets um, fishing for to feed their families, to feed their communities. So collective action seems to be alive at the local level, but at a broader societal level, the challenge of collective action seems to be increasing. Um, and an example I can give is when I ask um, one of my fisher friends uh, before this talk, um, you know, I had, the last time I talked was two weeks ago and I called him before this, say if there was any updates on what is the situation in Mexico. And he said, you know, uh, nothing has changed. Um, the federal government is completely absent. Um, there's no links with the federal government in terms of, of what are they going to do. The only thing they, they did, they did a survey to ask us how is COVID affecting us and what are we planning to do? What are we planning to do? Um, at the regional level, meaning the, the state governors, yeah, they are meeting, they're talking about what to do. And at local level, they're fishing for their families. Um, there, there's some people are, are um, fishing to feed poor areas. Uh, that's something I've also heard in, uh, happening in the United States. And, and Vivian, I think I mentioned this as well. So, so it's a very interesting dilemma, um, thinking about collective action. Um, in, in terms of how it's playing out at different levels of, of society. I also want to go back to the unpredictability um, as one key feature of fishing. Um, and here I'll, I'll share my screen uh, because this is something I've been discussing with my colleagues, um, my Mexican colleagues that I've been working uh, for a long time and I list their names above. We were discussing, okay, what are some of the the issues we see happening. And, and I think I want to first talk about the strengths, right? We, we think of fishing communities as crisis ready. Um, they have a lot of experience dealing with crises um, or hurricanes. And, and from what we hear, they're, they treat it with the same, with the same um, approach, if you will. Uh, they tell us, you know, we're not going to die from hunger. Uh, which might be very different to, to the reality Monivo was talking about. So, so, so there, are, there might be very important differences here. Um, and uh, some communities in Mexico have organized to close their access to other communities. Um, I mean, to, other, to outsiders as a way to, to stop the spread um, at, the, at their own risk of severing themselves from, from markets. So, so they're making clear choices of what to put first. Um, they also talk about uh, this is actually good because it's letting the fish um, you know, recover. 
uh, I might be overstating it because there's also, they also say, well, there's also illegal fishing happening now and nobody's paying attention. Um, as so for some vulnerabilities that they talk about is, yeah, there's recognition, there's increased connectivity to international markets and, and it's not a black and white situation. You know, some, some species uh, like lobster in Mexico, yeah, um, a high percentage of the market goes to China, goes to Europe, um, but, but the, the, the market that stays low, national goes to the tourism industry, which is also not gonna happen this year. So, so the high value species that have been sources of income and development for fishing organizations and cooperatives that you know well, Bonnie, from the northwest of Mexico, um, they, that only have high value species are suddenly are more at risk because there's no national markets to take their, their supply. Um, and, and the national market is usually low value uh, fish um, that it, at least in Mexico, doesn't consume that much fish. Um, so so this, this connectivity plays out based on the value of different species. Uh, they also still ask for more information, which you're not getting, you know, and, and uh, about new protocols when things come back to normal, you know, processing and commercialization. So, so th from what I hear from fishers, there's also the belief that this will pass. And I'm not sure if that's, that's actually correct, that, that the sensation that things will pass and will go back to after the hurricane. Um, and, and I think it's important to reflect in terms of the scholarship we do, because at least with fishing, um, when the word actually fishing is equated with harvesting. And the way we've done scholarship in the comments is that we have focused on harvesting. A lot of the theory, it's, it's based on understanding how harvesting takes place. Gordon's and Scott's work in the 50s and the story that Moniva is telling us, the story that Vivienne is telling us, the story that Bonnie told us goes way up, you know, beyond harvesting. It talks about pre-harvesting, post-harvesting, other areas outside of fishing that we should be thinking about when we're thinking about uh, community development. So there's in the commons, there's still this big division between fisheries management and community development, which, which we need to think of our frameworks or apply our frameworks in a way that, that don't perpetuate this, this, this conceptual division, which the, the word fishing self-perpetrates. You know, it's, it's usually a man or a couple of men on a boat harvesting. And the stories we hear is, you don't need a boat, doesn't necessarily need to be men, and the story about fishing, uh, it doesn't need to be harvesting. Uh, so, so I think those are important um, issues for, for commoners to, to be thinking about. And I think with that, we, um, I would like to open it to, to questions and comments from the, um, from the attendees and, and the rest of the panelists. Well, let me start by thanking the panel, panelists. Very, very interesting discussion. Um, <clears throat> so if you'd like to submit a question, please do so. Uh, you should have a Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen, your Zoom screen, where you can submit questions and we'll, we'll process those and <clears throat> try to pass them on to the, uh, the panelists. Uh, but I'd like to start by just observing a couple of things that I find really interesting here. And I think Javier, uh, Javier made some really great points. I mean, I'm a dyed in the wool, old fashioned Colin Clark, optimal harvesting trained person, although I never really worked on that because Colin would say, well, it was done in the 1970s. Strangely, some people still work on it, but um, the issues that really are coming out uh, that really struck me was first, the first thing that came up that Vivienne talked about was human rights based focus on management governance, equity, key, key issues versus economic efficiency, rationalizing fisheries, so on and so forth. Uh, one of the next things that came up uh, in Moniva's talk was this deep structural aspect of everything we discuss in the comments. So years and years and years, we've worked on social ecological systems. 
Recently, I've really tried to push for a reconceptualization around what we're calling coupled infrastructure systems. Many of you will cringe. I know you hate me talking about infrastructure, but what you've heard discussed today are different kinds of infrastructures interacting. Communities, when the international market infrastructure collapses, that boats, transportation, communication, financial services, they're collapsing because of COVID. Uh, local communities rediscover and reinvest in local social infrastructure, simple, simple mechanisms that people can, can mobilize to deal with issues. So I think this focus on structural, structural issues and in the modern context, understanding that we're always dealing, there's no such thing as a social ecological system, unless you carefully define what you mean by social and ecological. There are a couple of infrastructure systems. We heard Javier talking about boats. Well, after you bring the fish in, you have to process it. That's a building, it's plants, it's canneries, it's all that sort of stuff that comes together. And the last comment I'd like to bring out is robustness, resilience of coupled infrastructure systems. We heard Bonnie talk about diversity. Fishers have to diversify. Local communities have to diversify. Did we hear about modularity in some sense? Sure, because local communities can cut themselves off. I found it fascinating that local communities might be changing boundary rules, right? Becoming more modular, focusing on their own needs versus, and, and as Javier said, maybe at the cost of external markets. So we've, we've heard about diversity, modularity, redundancy I didn't hear so much about yet. I'm sure it's in there somewhere. So I'd like to, I'd like to just start with a really quick comment on, on this notion of diversity and re diversity, resilience, redundancy in small scale fisheries and whether they may have very, very powerful lessons for us to learn from. Thank you. Any of the panelists wants to react? Marco's comment. Again, please. You need to unmute yourself. Okay, I think um, Marty's um, summary makes me think a lot about where these communities are located, you know, and at least in Central America. We are using now a very interesting and nice concept that it's been used by the ICCA consortium, the Indigenous People and Local Communities Consortium, which is marine territories of life. And um, this idea, you know, that, that brought, makes broader, you know, the concept to bring in uh, all the diversity that we see in small scale fisheries makes me think that it's a much fair concept to think about. Even, even maybe even fairer than co the commons, you know, because it, it um, from some point brings in the idea of ownership, you know, of governance of those marine territories and the flexibility to change and the flexibility to adapt and the flexibility to maintain the, this vitality that we see even in a COVID-19 ocean in these territories of life. And I think that one of the issues we need to think about is that it is very amazing to see that the communities that we have marginalized and vulnerable lives uh, so much are the ones that are providing the food in some cases to all of us in the cities, in the areas next to these fishing communities, for these communities themselves. And this um, makes a big um, thinking about the responsibility we have as a society to retain that vitality and that resilience and to come with really good solutions to these um, bottlenecks that have been there forever. You know, um, you can't imagine how frustrated we can be that in countries in Central America, a small scale fisher that it's been there for the last 100 years is non-formal. So it's equitable with illeg illegal, you know? He is, for the governmental perspective, an illegal person. You know, we criminalized this right for living in this territory that has provided them for such a long time to survive. So I just wanted to, to bring again this idea of human rights-based approach. I think that's exactly what we need and we have the tool to implement it. We need to go strong on governments to tell them you need to really implement this um, voluntary guidelines that you approve in 2014 and bring them into life in these um, territories. 
Thank you, Vivian. I want to give a chance for anybody to jump in. Moniva? Um, yeah, Marty, I, I somehow got lost with your questions when you starting when you started with reductionist and resilience and really um, uh, kind of fitted too much in a Colin Clark uh, model for me that I, I felt I got a little bit lost in. Um, that said, I, I think that for me, it's very important that we unpack the notion of sustainability um, and the politics around sustainability. Uh, we we have this double speak, and I'm 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 reminded of um, Naomi Klein's work on a crisis a shock doctrine and 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 crisis uh, uh, narrative, and I'm thinking of the blue economy, and we're talking about sustainable blue economy. On the one hand, we are um, um, are making enclosures in terms of marine protected areas, excluding small scale fishers from entering in protected areas because it's exclusive zones and we are, are focusing on protecting the environment at the expense of livelihoods. And this is the current dilemma I see within the US. You know, we, we tend to kind of um, just look at the crisis narrative in terms of what is currently happening, but we don't really look at what the exclusion of a group of people in terms of, of this particular narrative of crisis on the one hand. Then we link it to the blue economy and we say that the blue economy is going to untap the ocean's resources in terms of oil and gas. And we get all the governments excited that now we're going to get all foreign in the direct investments and this is going to, this is going to uh, um, uh, create new income for us and jobs. And, and in all of that, you exclude uh, um, women, you exclude a group of people for the sake of elite tourism, for the sake of um, for the sake of uh, um, oil and gas at the expense of of a group of people. And I think it is it is important that we also need to look at what is the sustainable development goals and and also the human rights agenda and unpack the human rights agenda because the human rights agenda also has a privatization and a commodification uh, a perspectives to it so when we say we call for human rights um, it also means that uh, um, that oil company is can also call for their human rights in in terms of of the their particular uh, uh, perspective. So we need to really look at the issues of vulnerability, inequality, these structural issues that seem to be sidelined when we tend to focus on sustainability, when we tend to focus on the economy, and we, we kind of soften it by a human rights based approach. So for me, um, it, is, it is the perspective of justice that I think is, is key. And, and, um, and I've been trying to unpack the notion of blue justice for small scale fisheries that really look at what is the political economy questions and political ecology questions that we need to unpack in terms of whose agenda that we are talking about when we're dealing with the oceans and people is, is my If I may uh, pick, I, I just wanted to pick up on one little session, uh, one little issue that you raised that links to a question and then I think Javier will be able to speak to this as well. As you mentioned protecting the environment at the expense, expense of livelihoods. And one of, the, one of the participants raised the question or they, they requested a little more clarity on the difference between 
uh, or the distinction between fishing and the community. And I think it really boils down to uh, this difficult balance between lively, maintaining natural, natural systems versus livelihoods of those who rely on them. And you hit on that very early in your discussion. Uh, so that sort of balance between rights of nature and rights of people may be an interesting discussion as well, maybe in the terms of blue justice. Javier, do you, you want to pick up on that? It's sort of, that was your comment originally. Yeah, yeah, um, just briefly, then I want to go back to the questions. Yeah, I think what I was referring to is that more often than not, um, some of the, some of the, there, there's, a, there's an unnecessarily division between um, fisheries management and issues related to community development. And I think, I think comes back, fr comes from, from small scale fisheries management uh, adopting too many tools from industrial fisheries and and but when we are you are thinking about small scale fisheries you should be thinking about community development because the management of the fisheries is not separated from community development fishermen are not thinking how to manage their fisheries um, in, in a void they're thinking about balancing um, human rights issues or you know a lot of different issues uh, that inform how they go out to catch fish. Uh, so that's what I was commenting on. Um, there, there's an unnecessary division there. But, but I, and I believe this is what we're talking about uh, and the comments um, are being made about the, uh, the framework um, that you, you know, the couple infrastructure systems framework. I, I believe that what I'm hearing for Moniva and Vivian is that agents or people in that framework should have uh, some rights, right? That it should be, that they should come into the framework with a mm -hmm. strong morality, right? With a, and, and I mean, it, it is, it is pretty directive, right? But, but, um, but I think that's what we're talking about. The, the analytical framework, you're, you're saying, well, we can find a lot of generalities. We can find examples of robustness, modularity, diversity, redundancy. I think what the comment is, yes, but those, those, the agents in, in, in the framework uh, are not a blank slate. And yeah, I think that's what we're talking about. Two minutes before we need to go. Yes, any uh, other questions from the participants? Um, we'd be happy to address in the next couple of minutes. If not, uh, if not, we can get a quick reflection from each, each participant. Uh, I remember a paper a long time ago, very highly cited paper about governing for resilience. I'm wondering if um, uh, we could just govern for human rights and that would be it, right? Governing with all these details of measuring things, you know, lots of problems of information, lots of expensive infrastructure associated with gathering. Why not just say, throw all the rules away. And if we govern only on human rights, we have this one rule, sort of a Kantian moral imperative, everything will be fine. Any thoughts on that? I'm not saying that's the case. I'm just curious to say, oh, well, maybe, but we also need. Maybe yeah. I just say a thought on that. I think that small scale fisheries is a way of life. And I think that, uh, we might simplify, you know, the, the way and our approach to really fight with them for the issues that they believed had to be done. And they have been, without voice, screaming them up out loud for the last 40 years without much uh, listening from the different sectors that we hope. So in this new normality, I think we have a very strong responsibility of actually strengthening and backing up those issues that they have been fighting for. And they has to do with inequality. They have to do with justice. They had to do with an unfair distribution of benefits derived from the use of the biodiversity. There has to be uh, on a non-observance of what fisher women are doing. Um, so I, I really think that we need to be simple and try to find ways in which we can back up this integral approach for the use of the oceans that they have. And if we are clear that fishing is not only an issue of economic um, lining, you know, and how we can put the fish in the market, but it's a way in which um, communities can actually 
uh, interact with the rest of society in a very useful way, we might be moving ahead uh, with success. Uh, I really thank you very much for this opportunity. It's great. And let's think about that. You know, it's a way of life. Well, that's a great way to, that's a great point to end on. So I'd like to thank all the panelists uh, for participating and look forward to continued collaboration on these interesting ideas. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.